So I have a whole bunch of slides, and I don't anticipate getting through all of them. In fact, I anticipate only getting through calcium. So if all we do is get through calcium, that's fine. That's no problem whatsoever. Hmm. Oops. Okay. So let's start with a little bit of philosophy, okay? And this is, in fact, why I went into nephrology. You know, when all is said and done, what interests me is homeostasis. How is it that our bodies maintain themselves? And of course, I'm interested in ions, so it boils down to how does my body know I have enough sodium? How does it know I have enough calcium? How does it know where to put that calcium? Most of it being in the bone, a teeny little bit in the cells. How does that happen? And in fact, I mean, the real fundamental question is, how do we differentiate ourselves from non-self and life from non-self? Blow up and shrink every day. Why is the inside of my cells composed differently from the outside? And do cells of other animals and plants and other living creatures, are they the same as mine or are they different? I would also like to impart a little bit of history. This is great moments in divalent ion history of the recent past. This is, as you guys know, I'm a phosphate person. I like calcium too, but I'm really a phosphate person. So these were some huge events in the recent past. Number one, in 1993, was the discovery of the calcium sensing receptor. Does everybody here, has, has everybody here heard of the calcium sensing receptor? There is a nod, this is, this is bad. Okay, all right. The second in 2000 was the discovery of the hormone FGF23, fibroblast growth factor 23. May I see a show of hands who, who have even seen these three letters and the two numbers put together in the same word? One, two, two, okay, we got two down. All right. Okay, and then last but not least, was the discovery of trip M6 and trip M7. So obviously the first discovery had to do with calcium metabolism. The second was the first hormone <coughs> that was discovered that seemed to be primarily involved in phosphate metabolism as opposed to parathyroid hormone, for example, which is primarily involved in calcium metabolism and has secondary effects on phosphate. And then the third was a discovery of a magnesium transporter. And this may be hard for you guys to believe, but up until the year 2001, we had virtually no familiarity with any proteins that had anything to do with magnesium homeostasis. Everything was phenomenological. Magnesium gets transported here, it goes out there. We had no idea how. So this was a discovery of the first protein that we knew was directly involved in magnesium transport. And trip M6 is in the kidney, trip M7 is in the gut. Okay, where would you be without calcium? You would be a blob. You would be a blob because you would have no skeleton. You would have no endoskeleton you would have no exoskeleton. You might not even look that good. Calcium does a lot. Not only is it involved with the skeleton, so in other words, just maintaining our structure, it's also involved in transmission of electrical current. This is important, obviously, in the heart, skeletal muscle, nervous system. It's important for a number of intracellular processes, including programmed cell death. And we all know how important program cell death is, right? Because if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have fingers. We would have webs. So calcium is responsible for the destruction of the cells that come between our fingers so that we have five digits on each hand. Just one thing. Okay, this should be a figure that's kind of familiar to all you guys. Calcium homeostasis. We have it in the serum. The biggest repository is in the bone. 
obviously. We take in quite a variable amount depending upon your diet and the kidney gets rid of all of the extra. Now if you look at intestinal calcium absorption compared to what your intake is, you can see that at relatively low levels, there's a fairly tight correlation between um, what you take in and what you absorb, but boy, it just turns into a scatter plot, you know, when, when you get out here. It turns into an absolute scatter plot. There are lots of things that can influence your intestinal absorption of calcium. And you guys should know that um, more recently, although we have generally recommended that women take in 1,000 to 1,200 or 1,300 milligrams of calcium, it is now thought that the adult calcium need is probably less than 1,000 milligrams. Now, that's, that's not going to be on your board exam. Your board exam is still going to maintain the same numbers that they have so far, but I suspect that that will be down-regulated. So we all know that you get increased intestinal calcium absorption with vitamin D. That's the biggest thing. But there are a bunch of other things that will do it as well. You know, uh, extra renal production of vitamin D, like the sarcoidosis, um, et cetera. And you also see it in the uh, syndrome of idiopathic hypercalcuria, which is probably the single most common cause of calcium stones that there is. So those individuals, not only are they wasting calcium primarily from the kidneys, but they also have enhanced absorption. And then there are lots, a bunch of things that decrease calcium absorption in the gut as well. Now kidney is responsible then for your final homeostasis of calcium. And important things to take away are that the most of your calcium is reabsorbed in the proximal part of the nephron. So you can see at, up to this point, the end of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, that's 90% of your calcium has been reabsorbed. The portion of it that predominantly in the proximal tubule follows sodium absorption tremendously. This becomes important clinically. So when you have a low flow state in the proximal tubule and you're reabsorbing a huge amount of your proximal tubule ultrafiltrate, you're going to be reabsorbing all that calcium with it as well. This is a passive process, you know, meaning there's not a transporter that transports it across and it is not regulated by anything that we know except for biophysical processes that occur in the proximal tubule. Similarly, in the thick ascending limb as well, which is the other major site of absorption of calcium, this is a passive process, and it is dependent upon a number of things, the transepithelial potential difference, the calcium sensing receptor, which is sitting on the basal lateral membrane, and then paracelin, which is a protein that sits between the cells of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle and imparts permeability properties that are specific for calcium and magnesium. It isn't just anything that can come across. Now, the only place in the kidney, oh, and I, I should say that the absorption of calcium here is also very much tied to the absorption of sodium. So the more sodium that you have being reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb, the more calcium you have being absorbed too. Now, it is here in the distal convoluted tubule where you get the dissociation between sodium and calcium reabsorption. And this calcium reabsorption is active and it's regulated. This is the site of calcium absorption which is regulated by parathyroid hormone. And it is mediated by an epithelial channel that takes calcium up from the lumen, transports it across the membrane, and then in the basal lateral side, it gets spit out either by a calcium ATPase or a sodium calcium exchanger. All right, predictably enough, there are a gazillion things that can affect renal calcium transport. But again, from the standpoint of how you guys are managing somebody who has either hyper or hypocalcemia, the important things to remember are GFR and then the flow state in the proximal tubule. Again, I'm going to emphasize this because it is so important for calcium homeostasis. If you have a low flow in the proximal tubule, 
and an increase in proximal tubule absorption of sodium, you're going to increase your proximal tubule absorption of calcium and vice versa. If you have a fast flow state, you're going to decrease your absorption of sodium and your absorption of calcium will also go down as well. Now, there are lots of factors also that affect the bone flux of calcium, obviously being important because this is your major reservoir. Parathyroid hormone, vitamin D, acid base balance. We know that under conditions of metabolic acidosis, you know, the bone is like a gigantically huge buffer system. So as hydrogen ions get buffered in the bone, they release calcium. This is one of the reasons that individuals who have chronic metabolic acidosis will get bone problems. And one of the reasons that people who have chronic metabolic acidosis, say from renal tubular acidosis, will have hypercalcuria and calcium stones because of calcium reabsorption from the bone. Muscle activity. We don't talk about that very much. But this is a major factor in regulating how much calcium gets deposited in your bones or comes out of your bones. You think about it under the very, very, very rare occasions where somebody's been stuck in bed for three months and they develop hypercalcemia and they go, oh, wow, I guess this guy's got immobilization. But the fact of the matter is, this is true for all of us all the time. The amount of skeletal activity has a major role in how much calcium is deposited in your bone. You guys ever seen those studies that they've done on um, uh, tennis players, particularly female tennis players, where they look at the bone density of the right and left arms? They're hugely different. They are absolutely hugely different because of all of the muscle activity that occurs in the, usually the right arm, or the dominant arm, I should say. And then cytokines are very important um, for influencing bone calcium flux. And it is cytokine-induced release of calcium that probably plays a major role in the severe form of osteoporosis that occurs with diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. Because there you don't have issues of primary hyperparathyroidism. What you have is massive cytokine release. Also want to remind you, I know you don't need it, but I'll remind you anyway, is that calcium is in the blood in more than one form. And what we measure in the lab and what comes back on your BMP or your CMP <coughs> or whatever is total serum calcium, which is composed of your ionized, which is the active, your protein bound, predominantly to albumin, and your complexed which means that it is in sort of loose association with phosphate and citrate and, and other um, anions. So you measure the whole thing. And then internally you extrapolate, oh, about 50% of that is ionized calcium. And if it turns out to be about that, that's about right. On the other hand, if you have hypoalbuminemia, we know that your total serum calcium will go down we have a multitude of formulas that we can use to try to calculate what your total calcium would be if you had a normal albumin level. But the only way to really know if your ionized calcium is normal, quite frankly, is just to measure your ionized calcium. Alkalosis will change the binding properties uh, to, to uh, albumin such that you get an increased calcium binding to albumin. This results in a decrease in ionized calcium. And then we get a lot of blood products and you have a lot of citrate, you get a tremendous increase in your complexed fraction. So all of these things can affect both your total serum calcium as well as the fraction which is ionized, which is what you're interested in. All right. For all of us, what keeps us from developing hypocalcemia? Because certainly not every meal that you eat has a bunch of calcium in it. In fact, many meals that you eat don't have any calcium in them to speak of. So what happens is as your ionized calcium goes down, that concentration is picked up by a receptor called the calcium sensing receptor, which is sitting on the surface of the parathyroid glands. Your calcium sensing receptor can sense changes in ionized calcium 
that are as low as 0.1%. This is an extraordinarily dynamic process. Your ionized calcium, you were born with. And it is the same from when you were born to the time that you die unless you develop a disease. So when your calcium goes down, this activates the calcium sensing receptor to release parathyroid hormone. When parathyroid hormone is released, what happens? You increase your renal absorption, distal convoluted tubule. You make vitamin D, and this increases your gut absorption, and you release calcium from the bone. And all three of those things then serve to bring your serum calcium back up to normal, and then at that point, your PTH level goes back down. This happens every day, all the time, many, many, many times a day. Now, on the other hand, exactly the opposite happens if you become hypercalcemic. So if for some reason or other, you have some little release of calcium from your bone, or you've just eaten a big chunk of calcium in your meal or whatever, and your ionized calcium goes up, this is also sensed by your calcium sensing receptor, only the opposite happens. There is a decrease in the release of PTH, and remember that parathyroid hormone is a small peptide hormone, 84 amino acids. It gets chewed up in no time flat. So it doesn't get released and then just sit around in your body for days and days. It's gone. It's gone. When your PTH goes down, what happens? Your renal absorption goes down. Your conversion of 25 to 125 goes down. So your gut absorption goes down. And your bone release of calcium goes down. And these all serve then to bring your calcium back to a normal level. Does anybody have any questions about this so far? It is like just clear as mud, isn't it? Okay, let's just digress for a moment about the calcium sensing receptor because I said this was a seminal moment in divalent ion physiology that when this was discovered. It has a multiple different ligands. Note this one here, gadolinium, lanthanum as well. And the calcium sensing receptor is everywhere. I've just honed in on the fact that it's in the parathyroid, uh, um, parathyroid cells because that determines how much PTH is released. It's also in the kidney, in the stomach, uh, in the bone, in the brain, probably many other places. And actually, there's probably more than one calcium sensing receptor. In the kidney, it has a number of different effects as well. And alterations in the calcium sensing receptor function lead to human disease. And I will just highlight this right now. This is something that you need to know for your boards because although I wouldn't say this is rare as hen's teeth, it is a very popular and common question on your board exam to get a question about FHH, familial hypocalceric hypercalcemia. So this is caused by a mutation in the calcium sensing receptor that makes it less sensitive to calcium. So in other words, your ionized calcium has to go up higher to turn off PTH. It's got to go up higher. These guys have a high calcium, usually a normal to high normal PTH, normal phosphorus, and normal vitamin D. They are hypocalcuric. They are hypocalcuric. In some books, you'll read 24 gram calcium, less than 100 milligrams. Probably better to look at it as a calcium to creatinine ratio. They used to say, if it's less than 0.01, look for FHH. Now they're saying, look at it at 0.02. It has a 90% penetrance. It is autosomal dominant. These guys are asymptomatic. This is the person that is going to present to you in clinic for somebody 28 years old, coming in for, gee whiz, I think I better just establish health care. You get a BMP, and the calcium is going to come back 12. You're going to go, whoa. Totally asymptomatic. Now, on the other hand, if you have a homozygous um, uh, disorder where both alleles are affected, then this is, this is a profoundly severe disorder. But we don't see that. There are actually different subtypes based on where the mutation is. That's fun for people like me. It's probably not going to be that interesting to people 
that aren't interested in calcium and phosphate. So there are also diseases where the calcium sensing receptor is actually more sensitive to calcium than less sensitive. Autosomal dominant hypocalcemia, and then there are forms of acquired hypoparathyroidism as well that are caused by autoantibodies to the calcium sensing receptor. Um, I've actually diagnosed two of those at the VA, so this is not a terribly uncommon phenomenon. Okay, so who gets hypocalcemia? You can get it with poor GI absorption, which is actually not as common as you might think that it is. You can have it with renal loss, which is also not that common, or other things, which is probably the situation where we see it more. We tend to see it more in somebody who has pancreatitis, somebody who has rhabdo, and they have a sudden drop in their calcium. We also see it in uh, people who've had profound hyperparathyroidism, get their parathyroid glands out, and then develop hungry bone syndrome. And you can develop it with bisphosphonates. You remember, bisphosphonates will basically tie themselves to the bone and not allow calcium release. This is a wonderful thing if you are treating osteoporosis. If you are treating cancer and you are using high dose bisphosphonate, for example, to decrease bony mets, then you can get into substantial hypocalcemia because these are very long lasting medications. So who's at risk? Those with poor diet, small intestinal disease, renal failure, and then certainly people who've had neck surgery or radiation may have had their parathyroid glands out are also at risk. So there are many things you can do to diagnose hypocalcemia. The first thing that I always do, unless somebody actually presents with tetany, is to get an ionized calcium. Because amazingly enough, sometimes somebody will come in and their calcium will be six and a half. And you think, oh God, they've got to have a, a, a decrease in their ionized calcium but they might not. If they're totally asymptomatic, measure their ionized calcium. Okay, if they are hypocalcemic, have a low phosphate and a low magnesium, these suggest malabsorption. If they have a high parathyroid hormone level, but they're hypocalcemic, remember this means the person has secondary hyperparathyroidism. And obviously if they have an elevated BUN creatinine, they have kidney failure, um, as well. I have, I have once in my life pumped up somebody's blood pressure cuff and seen them do this. I mean, even in people that were really hypocalcemic. So I don't think that this is a very sensitive test. I've not really looked it up. But you can get that. Certainly tetany, fatigue, muscle weakness, prolonged QT, you can actually acutely get carpopedal spasm and perioral numbness. And of course, this is what happens when somebody hyperventilates. When somebody hyperventilates and their pH goes up, calcium binding to albumin goes up at the expense of ionized calcium. So their ionized calcium goes down. And that's why they complain to you, oh, my lips are tingling. Or they do this with their hands and their hands are doing that. Okay. If they are alkalemic or if they're hyperphosphatemic, make sure that you treat that first before you just start chunking in a bunch of calcium. If somebody is profoundly alkalemic or they have a very high phosphate and you start throwing in a bunch of calcium, you will get calcium phosphate deposition everywhere. Sometimes that's reversible and sometimes it's not. Well, only give parental calcium if, if they're really symptomatic. I said tetany here, but obviously if they're having some cardiac arrhythmia that you think is related to their hypocalcemia, then giving it parentally would be fine. Remember, 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 don't ever give calcium chloride through a peripheral vein. Don't ever do that. The person's arm will necrose off. Calcium chloride is very, very, very irritating. You can give it centrally, but not peripherally. That's why most of the time when you guys are in the middle of a code or something like that um, and you go look on the cart, they don't usually have calcium chloride. They usually have calcium gluconate, which is safe to give either peripherally or centrally. And obviously replete vitamin D if, if they have a problem. So if we go the other way around, causes of hypercalcemia, you can get enhanced gut absorption. 
enhanced renal reabsorption, and enhanced bone um, resorption. And let me just say that most of the time, it's not just one of these that'll do it. You generally have to have a combination of alterations in two or three of these. Okay, so who gets hypercalcemia? People that have primary hyperparathyroidism, solid epithelial tumors, neoplasias, lymphatopoietic system, and actually a whole bunch of endocrinopathies are associated with hypercalcemia. There are also a whole set of drugs that are associated with hypercalcemia, and these are another fun thing that they ask you about on the board exams. So remember, particularly ones that they'd like to ask about are lithium and thiazides. They probably won't ask about theophylines because those aren't used very much at all anymore. Again, if there's a question, measure the ionized calcium. I see this a lot in my clinic at the VA. Some older guy will come and his calcium is 10.3 or 10.5, a little bit above normal. You know, before you get excited and start looking for his lung cancer or whatever, measure the ionized calcium first. When you have a high calcium and a high PTH, this is diagnostic of primary hyperparathyroidism. A low phosphate is also suggestive of primary hyperparathyroidism as well. And the clinical manifestations of hypercalcemia are extraordinarily dependent upon the rapidity and severity um, and on the underlying disorder as well. But there are many, many, many different manifestations. Fatigue, lethargy, and coma. Remember that hypercalcemia can actually produce acute kidney injury, kidney stones, and it is one of two electrolyte causes of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The other one is what? Does anybody know? The other electrolyte cause of nephrogenic DI. Anyone? Anyone? It's hypokalemia. So hypokalemia is the other. So the two electrolyte causes of nephrogenic DI. You had anorexia, nausea, constipation, and then obviously QT shortening. Now, so when you see your, your cancer patient, the woman who comes in who has breast cancer and she's got a calcium of 16 or 18, I can guarantee you that this is not how it started. She started with some hypercalcemia, yes, maybe 12 or 13, but then what happened? She got lethargic. She got nephrogenic DI and got more volume depleted. Remember we talked about what happens when you have a low flow state. She had anorexia and nausea, so was drinking and eating less. And so this is how these people who have generally humorally mediated hypercalcemia due to cancer, this is how they get so profoundly hypercalcemic, is everything else together, then they cycle up into a calcium instead of being 13 or 13 and a half, is suddenly 16, 18, or 22. Okay. Um, the treatment of hypercalcemia um, has actually evolved over the years quite a bit. Um, if you can treat the underlying cause, great. Um, remember that most of these people are volume depleted, so you need to replete them with saline. You know, when, when I was a fellow, which is admittedly a long time ago, um, we would always replete somebody tremendously with a bunch of saline and then give a big slug of a loop diuretic. As I'm sure many of you are aware, these, um, this, this therapy was based on a very, very, very few patients, quite frankly. Um, and later studies have not shown consistently that a loop diuretic, which you would think would decrease calcium absorption at the thick ascending limb, have not been able to show that it actually works that well. So that's not recommended. And most of us, after volume repleting somebody, you should still do that, you know, hit the bisphosphonates. Sometimes calcitonin, it's fast. It's got very, very, very few side effects. And sometimes if you're waiting for the bisphosphonate to work, you know, you can go ahead and, and give them some calcitonin. Obviously, if somebody's got sarcoidosis, glucocorticoids are gonna be the treatment of choice. Okay, now we have our fun interactive session. We have about 15 minutes to be fun and interactive, okay? So this is case one, 27-year-old man, Routine lab work, he has a calcium of 12.2, he's asymptomatic. His ionized calcium is six milligrams per deciliter, so that is high, I mean, definitely high. PTH is a, kind of on the high side. His 125 is not that high. 
24 urine calcium is 325 milligrams with a creatinine of 1,400 milligrams. Okay, so, so what are you guys thinking here in terms of differential diagnosis? Would we all agree he's hypercalcemic? Okay, and so he's hypercalcemic, and he has true hypercalcemia, right? Because his ionized fraction is high as well. Okay, so I hear a voice in the wilderness saying maybe FHH. Let's consider the possibility of FHH. So let's remember then that somebody who has familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia, the hallmark of that disorder, besides the fact that they're asymptomatic, is what is the 24-hour urine calcium? High, normal, or low? <laughs> it's really low. It is really low. You know, like I said, some people say less than 100 milligrams. You can do the calcium to creatinine ratio. On this guy, if you do either way, this guy is frankly hypercalcuric. This guy is frankly hypercalcuric, so you can knock out the diagnosis of FHH. Does everybody understand that? This guy has hypercalcemia and hypercalcuria both. So he does not have FHH. He does not have familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia. Any other ideas? Okay, primary hyperparathyroidism. Is this case consistent with a diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism? He has a high calcium. If somehow or other I took Adam here and I stuck an IV in his arm, no, let's say centrally, and I gave him a bunch of calcium chloride and somehow shot his calcium up to 12, what would you expect his PTH to be? Very low, exactly. The normal response would be suppression of the parathyroid hormone. Is this guy's parathyroid hormone suppressed? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If this guy had hypercalcemia due to sarcoidosis, what would you expect to see? A lower PTH and a high 125 vitamin D. That is exactly right. Okay, if somebody had milk alkali syndrome producing hypercalcemia, what would you expect the PTH to be? High, normal, or low? Low. It's going to be low because the high calcium is mediated not by parathyroid hormone, but by the fact that people that are on milk alkali, they're usually taking a bunch of vitamin D and a bunch of calcium as well. So most likely cause of this guy's hypercalcemia is primary hyperparathyroidism. This is, this is a, a, a picture that is consistent with primary hyperparathyroidism. Wow. What do you think about primary hyperparathyroidism in somebody who is 27? What is the demographic of primary hyperparathyroidism? Okay, so somebody brings up the possibility this guy could have a multiple endocrine neoplasia. Why do you think it's multiple endocrine neoplasia, not just regular run-of-the-mill primary hyperparathyroidism? Who gets, who gets primary hyperparathyroidism? Sporadic. Me, right? Middle-aged and older women, predominantly, will get primary hyperparathyroidism. This is not a disease that just strikes, sporadic, I should say, primary hyperthyroid. This is not a disease that usually strikes 27-year-old, otherwise healthy people. So one possibility is a multiple endocrine neoplasia type syndrome. And how are you going to figure that out? What are you going to ask about? What, what in the history? I mean, you're right, you're right. But what, else, what in the history are you going to ask about? I couldn't hear all that, but I, I'm assuming that somebody said something about family and five members of the family having neck surgery, you know, or something like that. So you're going to ask about that. So that's one possibility. Okay, so the guy goes, nope, oh, you know, and 
Nobody, nobody in the family has ever had any kind of endocrine tumors at all. What else might you consider in a 27-year-old who gets sporadic hyperparathyroidism? Sometimes people who've had irradiation, sometimes it ablates the parathyroid hormone, but sometimes instead, you know, what they get is neoplasm. And then there are the very, very few instances where people actually get parathyroid carcinomas. Now let me just say, somebody who has parathyroid carcinoma actually usually has a much, much higher calcium level and much higher PTH level, but, you know, it starts somewhere. Okay, <clears throat> so what would you do next? You think this guy has primary hyperparathyroidism. What would you do next? What kind of perhaps interesting little piece of information have I not given you up here? Well, I didn't give you phosphorus, and I didn't give you what else? Or my favorite subject? The BUN and creatinine. You know, what if this guy has a BUN of 120 and a creatinine of 15, and he's got a calcium that's high and a PTH that's high? What are you going to call that? That's tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So this is somebody who, because with, remember, with secondary hyperparathyroidism that you get with kidney failure, that is driven by the low calcium and the high phosphorus and the low vitamin D, okay? Once, if the parathyroid glands escape all regulation, then that person's calcium will go up. So that is then called tertiary hyperparathyroidism. He's actually asymptomatic. He probably does not have a BUN of 120 and a creatinine of 14 and a half, but, but still, it would be important information to get. Okay, so, but let's just say his kidney function is totally normal. His phosphorus is two also going along with primary hyperparathyroidism. What are you going to get next? I think somebody said Sestamibi scan. I, I don't want to put the words in anybody's mouth, but I think somebody said Sestamibi scan. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you're, so you're going to look, you're going to look for, you know, where is this coming from? Is it a single gland that's gone out of control, one nodule? Is this hyperplasia all over the place or whatever? Sure. And so, in this individual, what would your best treatment be? Surgery. Surgery. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you look at the uh, recommendations from the Endocrine Society on who to do surgery on who has primary hyperparathyroidism, certainly somebody less than the age of 40, you know, is, is an indication. So this person is less than the age of 40, 24-hour urine calcium greater than 400, you know, used to be, you know, one of the criteria. If they drop that one out, um, a low bone mass is another one, kidney stones or um, um, a low bone mineral density are other indications for doing surgery. All right, what if this kid goes, I'm not going to have surgery. I've never had surgery and I never want surgery. What would your other options be? Okay, so what did we talk about before that regulates PTH secretion? What is that like receptor that's sitting there? Yes, yes, calcium sensitive receptor. That's exactly right, calcium sensitive receptor. Well, it just so happens we have a drug. We have a drug that can activate the calcium sensing receptor. There is only one on the market. We use it all the time in the dialysis unit. It's extraordinarily effective. I've had people who's had PTH levels of 3,000 that we have brought down to 500 by using this calcium sensing receptor agonist. It's called Sinicalcet or Sensapar is, is the trade name for it. That would be a distant second line of treatment 
in this individual, but if for whatever reason, he 100% absolutely refused to have surgery, that would be an option. Now, on the other hand, using sinicalcet for the treatment of, of primary hyperparathyroidism is actually sanctioned in older individuals who aren't having that much trouble. So if their calcium is not that high, they haven't broken a bunch of bones, they're not having kidney stones or kidney failure, there have been many studies now you know, looking at keeping people on calcium sensing receptor agonists for as long as 5, 10, and 15 years with actually quite good results. Near normalization of the calcium, stabilization of the 24-hour uh, urine calcium and of the bone mass as well. So, so that's an option to think about. All right, so we have like maybe three seconds for this next one. All right. Okay, so a 56-year-old man here who was found in his, actually, before I go to this, does anybody have any questions about the last case? Okay, that is just, you know, plant it in your head. That's a pretty classic case of primary hyperparathyroidism. High calcium, non-suppressed PTH that's a little bit above the upper limits of normal, a high 24-hour urine calcium as well. Okay. All right, so we have 56-year-old man now. It's found in a hot apartment, admitted for kidney failure. Um, he's been on a torvastatin, and here is his um, salient lab work. He's a little hypercalcemic. Uh, hyp I'm sorry. He is a little hyperkalemic. His creatinine is five and a half. His calcium is kind of low. His phosphorus is kind of high. His CK is really high, and his PTH is high as well. Okay, so why does this guy have hypocalcemia? He's got hypocalcemia due to rhabdo. Why do you get hypocalcemia with rhabdo? I'm sorry? I, I can't hear you. Well, the renal failure can certainly contribute to it, but let's face it. I'm hearing a whole bunch of stuff. Yes. Okay, so it's multifactorial. One of them is that certainly in the face of uh, kidney failure, you know, you have less vitamin D production, you know, and so you have less calcium absorbed. Um, additionally, when you have hyperphosphatemia, which this guy has, you have complexing of the calcium and the phosphate, and that'll fall out all over the place. And then last but not least, don't forget that when you have damage to a tissue, be it your pancreas, or your skin, or your muscles, or whatever, you get tremendous amounts of calcium deposited in those spots. So this is pretty classic for rhabdomyolysis to have kind of this, uh, and, and tumor lysis is another one where you see it, you know, to see this, this maybe seems like out of proportion hypocalcemia in the face of kidney failure. Because all of us have seen many, many people who came in through the emergency room who had a creatinine of five and a half, an acute kidney injury, and most of them don't have a calcium of six. Let's face it, they don't have a calcium of six. So, okay, so he's got hypocalcemia that is multifactorial, you know, due to his rhabdo. So how would you treat it? Oh, actually, why does he have rhabdo? Statin and in a hot apartment, you know, sitting there in the heat wave with a statin, non-traumatic rhabdo. Okay, so how would you treat his hypocalcemia? Okay, I think I heard the word phosphate. I hope that that didn't mean that you meant to give him more phosphate. So, no, you would get his phosphate under control, be one of the first things that you would do. What else? Would you give him calcium? IV calcium gluconate, IV calcium chloride? Why or why not? What would you want to know? What else have I, have I not told you here? Yeah, I didn't show you his EKG. I didn't tell you whether or not this guy was seizing, you know, for example, or he's sitting there like this, you know, and can't move because he's titanic. Um, so, yeah, so if he's completely asymptomatic, you got some time. You got some time. You can treat his hyperphosphatemia. You can see whether or not the guy is volume depleted or not volume depleted that's contributing to his, uh, his kidney failure. And what is like perhaps a problem that you see here, another problem that 
his hypocalcemia might exacerbate. His K, his potassium. So this guy is already hyperkalemic, and you know, we, one of the things that we do to try to blunt the cardiac effects of hyperkalemia is to give supplemental calcium. So that would be certainly the case if you got the EKG and it looked like this guy had significant um, evidence of hyperkalemic, well, effects on the, on the cardiac conduction system, then you would want to give this person calcium anyway, even though their phosphorus was already high. But otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to treat the underlying disorder. And you're going to monitor his status in terms of his neuromuscular and his cardiac status and his head, because you know you don't want him to seize. Um, and the natural history of hypocalcemia with rhabdomyolysis is that as these guys get better, the calcium is released back into the circulation from the muscles. So, and I can tell you I see this all the time, not on the medicine service, on the surgery service, but I see all the time just chunk after chunk after chunk of calcium gluconate given. Guy's calcium is six, calcium, calcium, calcium. Next morning at six that afternoon, calcium, calcium, calcium. So what happens is when their kidney function recovers and their rhabdo goes away, and I've seen people's calcium jump up as high as 13 or 14. Um, I'm not sure anybody here was, was in the room here when we had this phenomenal case at the VA a year ago or so of a guy who came in with some degree of kidney failure with some rhabdo and was hypocalcemic and got just a ton of calcium. His kidney failure was getting better, so we let him go home. And he came back in a total goofball complete goofball. And his family goes, you know, we can't take care of him. I guess whatever happened to him, it really fried his head, you know, and we like to place him in a nursing home. I mean, that was, that was the reason they brought him back. We measured his calcium, and it was 13 and a half. It was 13 and a half. The minute his calcium came back down to near normal, I mean, the guy woke up and went, God, I felt terrible. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, your calcium was 13 and a half, and he was fine. So remember that, that with rhabdo, with pancreatitis, with tumor lysis, that calcium just gets sequestered into tissues, and then it'll all get released again. So I'm just going to ask one last question. Why is this PTH high? Because his calcium is low. That is exactly right. And the point that I'm making here is the development of secondary hyperparathyroidism is really, 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 really fast. It happens almost immediately. So when you see this person come in with, with kidney failure and you measure their PTH, if they've got a PTH that's 100 or 120 or 200 or something like that, that doesn't mean that they've had renal failure for a decade. <laughs> this can happen very, very, very rapidly and conversely. The minute the kidney failure gets better, the PTH will come right back down. So, all right, so we interacted for 15 minutes. You guys did great. So, any questions about these two cases? Yes, sir. No. 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 I mean, not unless their kidney function doesn't recover. If their kidney doesn't, you know, kidney function doesn't recover or they're left with some unexplained, you know, calcium phosphorus abnormalities that I would but otherwise know, it'll go down by itself. The same thing, you know, conversely, like I said, the, the 125 vitamin D will go really low and then it'll just spring back. It'll just, I mean, the minute the kidney function starts getting better, bingo. You can get huge high levels of vitamin D um, as well. That's a good question, and I probably would. I probably would because, you know, I didn't give you, you know, an albumin on this guy. For all you know, this guy's albumin is 1.2, you know, and maybe that calcium of 6.1 really isn't all that low. I probably would measure an ionized calcium on them, though. 
there's a considerable amount of, of uh, literature in the critical care in the critical care um, you know literature that that you know people who are modestly hypocalcemic in the unit tend to have more problems you know difficulty getting them off the vent and and issues like that um, and so I do see I see a lot of calcium used in in the critical care unit I'm not sure that there's really a good basis for that truth be told it's certainly one thing to say you know somebody um, who is in the unit who has a lower calcium doesn't do as well but that does not the same thing as saying if I bring their calcium up to normal they're going to do better you know because their calcium may be low because they've got bunches of other stuff going on that just also results in the calcium being low so I'll have to say I, I, I pretty much unless they've got some symptom or some sign that is driving me to replace it I usually won't yes Absolutely. You know. To what extent? I mean, so we're saying would it never get up to 13 or higher or something like that? 13 would be pretty high for volume depletion. But certainly getting up to even as high as 11 would not be out of the question with volume depletion. Because, I mean, have you ever seen, I mean, somebody who really comes in massively volume depleted, I mean, sometimes their albumin is five and a half. You know, so, you know, they can, they can have a lot of, of protein bound, you know, calcium. Okay, thank you guys.